the Edge, everything bass fishing. Coming to you worldwide from MegaWare Kill Guard Studios. What is up, Bass Edge Nation? Long time no see. It has been just out of this world. Haven't seen you since May earlier. I guess that's really springtime. So, man, it's just been a crazy long summer. So much going on. Um, big shout out to MegaWare Keel Guard, proud sponsor of Bass Edge Radio. Uh, also, shout out to Bass Cat Boats, man. Appreciate them being around. And, uh, man, it's been a great year running Bass Cat. Really, really have enjoyed that boat. Last time we checked in was uh, just after the Clear Lake event at the uh, Juan Bass. And I think that was event number two. Yeah, Clear Lake was event two. It's been such a long time ago. Then we had, I went straight to Havasu not long after that in early May. Uh, had a had an awesome event out there. Uh, Lake Havasu has been good to me for many, many years. And, and it was good to me again. I had a top three out there at Lake Havasu. And man, then I had an incident. And that is what has kept me away from the podcast for so many weeks, almost see you, may june july august september five months five months away from the podcast but man i had an incident with my dog and uh the dog got mad at me i didn't get really mad at my dog a lot of people say i should have shot the dog <laughs> but that's that's a whole different deal but man i had a, <clears throat> i had a situation where i scarred up my face and and had a a bad deal happened and it was until the middle of july that that thing finally healed and uh, you don't want to see photos. It was it was an ugly mess for quite a while. But anyway, so I had to kind of stay away from the camera. We just stayed off air and and uh, just thought we'd catch up Bass Edge, obviously, after things got better. And finally they did. But, man, it was just full bore right into iCast right after I got better and had my youth camps up in New York. And then by the time we got back and, and resettled, it was August, almost September, and anyway, finally, we are back here on Bass Edge Radio. So thanks for hanging out with us. Appreciate you guys being around. And um, man, we're going to have several more shows here for you at the end of 2023, or excuse me, 2024. I'm even lost in my years, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be a good last couple of uh, shows. Talk obviously about forward facing sonar, all the changes that are going on with all the tours. Talk about some things that happened throughout the tours this year that I feel like is just good information for any listeners. Not getting into uh, too much drama or that kind of thing, but it, it's. It's uh, going to be fun to talk about, but uh, we're going to talk today about the uh, Lake Mead Wand Bass event that just took place a couple weeks ago. I just got home, and we're going to have our featured angler is going to be Julius Mazzi. He took the championship at Lake Mead. Julius says, I think this is his first big win. We're going to break down what he did, how he did it. We're going to hear more about what he thinks about some changes that have happened over at Bass. Julius was fishing the Bassmaster EQs for several years and uh, decided just to stay on the West Coast this year, fishing all the uh, Wand Bass events similar to, to my event schedule. So uh, it's going to be fun to have Julius on board and kind of have him as the today's featured angler and, and break down things that are happening in the industry. I got to give a shout out. You know, Lake Mead was a, a okay event for me. I finished 41st. I think we had a little over 100 anglers, 103, 104 anglers out there. But, uh, man, I got to give a shout out to um, my man, Matt Pano, over at Optimum Baits. Man, this is the Ima Skimmer. Found a lot of my fish on top water using, using the Ima Skimmer. These used to be, uh, these, these were out of stock for a long time. A lot of the great top water products. That's the uh, baby stick chrome well if hartwell was happening this week actually julius told, just told me that the uh hartwell bass open event has been rescheduled to lake martin so uh it's going to be fun to see how how the uh, anglers react to a new fishery and a new dynamic really quickly lake martin got some good largemouth in it obviously but uh predominantly spot fishing um Spotted bass, that is. I was thinking about the uh, event or one of the last events that they've, a uh, big events that they've had there at Lake Martin and Roy Hawk, a Western angler who's doing obviously tremendously well out, out in the uh, West Coast this year. He's not fishing the Bass Pro Tour, but 
He's taken lots of money out west this year like he normally does, but uh, he caught a bunch of good largemouth square billing. So Lake Martin's going to be a fun event to watch. Um, you're going to be able to catch some fish on a bone colored. I'm a finesse popper though. Man, all of these baits back in stock, find them at your, your retailers. If they were going to Hartwell, this would have been a hot lick, but uh, it, it could still be good at Lake Martin. I think there's a saying like if you're not throwing chrome, you know, it's just, it's, you're not probably going to win at some of those blueback herring lates. But uh, I love this color skimmer. It's uh, also called a blueback herring, but it's an awesome bait. I do like to add the feather back there. This, this bait sits far down in the water after you twitch it. It works the top really well. It's got a nice rattle to it. But when it sits down in the water, I like how this feather really comes down to the fish if they're following it. Does that little undulation. It's a great bait to get bit on. Anyway, check out all the Ima lures because they are back in stock. And uh, you can find them at Tackle Warehouse, most of your favorite Ima lure retailer locations. But uh, we're going to talk more about topwater fishing. We're going to talk more about Lake Mead. We are going to talk more about what is going on in the industry with the bass opens. Um, we are going to talk more about lots. Uh, of bass edge radio thanks for tuning in appreciate you being here don't go away right after this message our feature angler julius maz is going to be right here with us on bass edge radio you know the importance of protecting your investments so choose the protection the pros pick Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our patented technology. The MegaWare Keel Guard is made tough and made to stick. Install it yourself in less than an hour, providing the most dependable, most trusted protection for your boat, guaranteed for life. Insist on the original Keel Guard the pros have picked for 25 years. MegaWare Keel Guard. <laughs> Since 1971, Basscap Boats has innovated, persistently thinking outside the box, never abandoning their roots or the commitment to quality through their process. Clearly visible in the new Puma STS, their design and development continues to evolve, improving performance, enhancing the angler's experience, and broadening the appeal of the sport they have dedicated their lives to. Basscap Boats, feel the rush. Welcome back. Here we are. We got the man on the show, Julius Mazzi, with us here on Bass Edge Radio, your 2024 Juan Bass Lake Mead champion. Julius, how does that sound, man? Does that does that get old? I like it. I like, it. I like Lake Mead in front of it. That's that's pretty special to me. <laughs> That is awesome. Uh, Julius, great to crazy. have you on the show. It's uh, awesome to have you here, um, you know, catching up a little bit before the show. You're a Phoenix guy, Fe fishing out of Phoenix, yeah. Arizona area, kind of grew up there around, uh, was it Pleasant or Roosevelt? Which one's on that north? Big, north big Pleasant, like North Phoenix area. Pleasant, Pleasant. And yeah. uh, man, thanks for having me. Yeah, brother. It's it's awesome to have you here. Let's talk a little bit about your uh where where's Julius from? Like what got him to where he's at today? How did it get started? You're a young dude, you're mid-20s. How old are you? About 20. I'm 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 trying to age you. 26. 26, mid 20s. 26. I, was, I was right there. Okay. So, uh, man, how, how does Julius come up into the industry now being Juan Bass Lake Me champion? Yeah. Uh, crazy. So, I actually grew up, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in Cancun, Mexico when I was Ooh. a kid. Did not but my that. dad, uh, he's in the hotel industry. He's just a white boy from Pennsylvania, but he ended <laughs> up down south and, uh, you know, he, he stayed down there a while and I, I grew up, you know, around the ocean and, and fishing, you know, on the beach all the time. So kind of fishing was in my blood. And then we moved to Florida when I was like eight years old, seven years old and uh, a pond in the backyard. I actually lived like uh, right next to the St. John's River in Julington Creek right there. Oh, wow. That's so I cool. grew up, I grew up on St. John's growing up and, uh, that's where I learned how to bass fish. 
And then we ended up moving here. Uh, I was still pretty young, you know, probably 12 or 13 and been, been in Arizona ever since, uh, nice. which I didn't even know they had bass when we moved here, you know? <laughs> you you thought you were but, leaving uh, Florida and bass fishing paradise for the desert and you had no clue what you were getting into, huh? Yeah. I'm like, it's over. I'm done fishing. But no, my dad uh, always been a supporter of my fishing. And he, he put me in a junior bass club, you know, when I was little. And you know how it goes, man. Just start showing up to tournaments and learning and, you know, got addicted. And the, the hookup tackle was a small building at Lake Pleasant. Okay. And uh, it was just a bait shop. They had like cool stuff in there that you didn't see anywhere else. It was a small little tackle shop that like Lake, Lake Essentials, but then they'd have a OSP crankbait, you know, and it's like, you don't <laughs> see that anywhere else on the shelf. And that was 15, 20 years ago, almost so, or 15 years ago. So uh, I, I ended up becoming good buddies with, with the owners there. And, and Ben told me when I was 16, that uh, I could have a job there as a guide. And, you know, as long as I came in with my license and my guide license, I, I could learn how to be a guide there. So sweet. sure enough, that's what I did. And first day I, I could get my driver's license, I went and got it and drove drove straight there with my dad and said, all right, I'm ready, ready to start working. So Ben gave me the opportunity to just be on the water all the time. You know, mm-hmm. whatever kind of guide trip it was, I was just always on the water. And if I wasn't guiding, I was, you know, just – fishing on my own as much as I could Very and, cool. you know, fishing high school tournaments. Cause I was still young, young. So I was fishing high school tournaments, guiding and just grinding and learning as much as I could. Very cool. Yeah. The, the hooked up tackle, it's kind of like kind of nationally legendary for its JDM hookup, <laughs> you might say. And, uh, did, did, yeah. um, has that always been the case for, for that shop? I know a lot of people know about it because of its online, you know, sales and, and, uh, but they, you know, and, and I've actually been by their brick and mortar, which I assume it's that same side of Phoenix, that kind of Northwest side, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's about 30 minutes, uh, South of Lake Pleasant. Okay. Uh, it's, it's in town now, but it's a, it's a big retail store and it, I mean, it's got more, it looks like you're in Japan. We've had Japanese anglers come in and say this literally looks like you're in Japan. So it's it's definitely grown. Uh, it's a super niche type store, but um, my boss Ben, he's very very you know smart and successful guy as far as figuring out the marketing side of things for the JDM tackle, and he kind of grabbed a hold of the market and figured it out, and it's been cool to uh, watch it grow. We've got a YouTube channel. Um, you know, I'm super active on there, doing all kinds of instructional JDM you know, breakdowns on baits that you probably can't find information on. So right. it's been a fun road, L- little less, less guiding and more, you know, content creation and just working with companies and that kind of stuff. Awesome. The tournaments. So, so if I break open the hatch on your boat, is it just, it's like a JDM supermarket or what? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> If I break open the front hatch on your boat, is it just like a JDM supermarket in there or what? It's just like all JDM lures and stuff? or Yeah, or- you, you never know. No, there's definitely some uh, some stuff you've never seen in there and uh, <laughs> some, some goofy things and some secret <laughs> things, but... That doesn't mean there's not a, a jig in there and a, and a buzz frog or something, you know? Right, right, right. A little bit of everything. Still, I got you. you know, still, still got my roots, but you, there's definitely some sneaky stuff in there. Let's, uh, for the listeners, and, and you know, Lake Mead, probably one of the best um, pattern lakes in the country. You hear a lot about that with the U.S. Open that went on there for so many years. Uh, probably a little bit why you're – proud to be a Lake Mead champion in, in the Juan Bass circuit as well. But um, Lake Mead is just extremely vast, even though the water level's down, whatever it is, hundred and some feet, it's still a huge place. Uh, there's a, what, what, what did it end up being? 168 or some, 173. Yeah. I was asking you cause I couldn't yeah. figure it out. We were trying to figure out. That's exactly right. We saw each other at the ramp before the tournament. We were putting uh, putting our boats on together, uh, leaving for the day. 
and it was what's the offset on your graph and i think i had kind of dialed it up around 172 i think you thought you were a little off at 165 or something like that and, yeah it's uh, like 165 <laughs> that's just amazing but but yeah so come the thing but yeah so it's 170 foot low thereabouts yeah. but still a huge vast fishery how do you go into you know, you've been traveling with the uh, Bass EQs, the open events, you know, looking to try to maybe get a spot on the Elite Series for how many years did you fish the EQs? Three or four? Yeah, four. Uh, I think the first year I fished two divisions. And then once they made the switch to the EQs, I've fished every year till this year and, you right. know, had some good events, had some bad ones. Just hard to have nine consistent events with you know, new bodies of water. Yeah. And, you know, Absolutely. I spent a lot of time staying on the road and just trying to break down a lot of these fisheries. Like, you know, fishing the high school stuff, you, you'd got, you'd get the opportunity to go to championships, but it was always kind of like Tennessee river stuff. It wasn't. So other than, than that, I never really traveled back East other than a couple times a year. Um, so it was, it was hard, you know, you kind of get in a groove and have three good events and then you'd go to a region where like I should have had a good event. You, you break it down enough, but shit changes that you've never seen before. And it's right. hard to adapt and has really made me a, a better angler over the years and having the West coast, you know, mindset, it's, it's a lot different and definitely, you know, I've learned on the West coast out there, but then there's also days where, Nothing I know works, you know, yeah. <laughs> definitely learned a lot. So that, and that's kind of where I was taking that. Do you, do you feel like being that Lake Mead is such a pattern lake and, and you spent so many, you know, several years fishing lots of new bodies of water where you kind of got to go and be open-minded and do that thing. Do you think that in turn helped you at Lake Mead with its vastness you know, ability to strategize through pattern fishing. Do you think that kind of sets you up maybe to help get, get the win at Lake Mead two weeks ago? Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely had a lot of confidence to come back out West right, right before I hadn't been able to fish Lake Mead for probably five years, you know, traveling. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I went, I had a really good shot to win the U S open. I think I finished 11th. Uh, so like I was, Pumping at the bit to uh, get back there, and I felt like my mindset was if I was fishing against those bass open guys, or you know, like you you have to find what the majority of the field because the majority of the field's trying to win, and they're looking for a certain thing. And I kind of just put that mindset. I go whether it's there or not because I hadn't been to Mead in a while. I just that's what I did. I, I knew I needed to find suspended fish. But there was also going to be some big largemouth, you know, push shallow in those pockets like old school Lake Mead. And I needed to do a one-two punch. And uh, my goal was just to find areas that had all the ingredients I was looking for. And then I'd fish shallow and deep in the same pockets. So mm -hmm. that way I could kind of, you know, rotate. And I picked two or three areas that I found those ingredients in. And I rotated two to three spots in each area every day. And I would hit like... You know, if I catch them in this one the first day, I'd, I'd go to the one next to it. And then, you know, if I felt like I needed to run in there and check it, I would. But I would just try to fish new water every day and look for that bait. I actually did a lot of scanning in the tournament, which is something that, you know, when I first started fishing back east, I would have never, like, you know, thought to do. But I was guys would, you know, tell me, like, dude, if you just don't just fish like take 20 minutes and look around and break it down in your head why why you're going to fish there and, and i really remembered that and i did that in this event and Very i would take cool. the time you know roll in if i didn't see it i wouldn't make a cast right right so so, <clears throat> so you talked about you know old school mead some shallow stuff grass fishing is typically kind of what what goes on in that sector and and you we've always seen, you know, the Lake Mead striper action and, and we've heard and, and we hear about, yeah. you know, anglers getting on fish, you know, similar to that situation. Now with forward facing sonar, really the first, I mean, big tournament. I mean, Juan Bass hasn't been back there for quite a while and 
course, Nevada, you know, clubs, Utah clubs, you know, they and, and maybe even some Arizona clubs, they have tournaments there, but not the big events where you're, you know, 75, 80, 100 plus votes. This is probably, yeah. the, in my mind, the first event there that's had four facing sonar in a large tournament style capacity. Um, did you yeah. feel like that that kind of, you know, opened up a new Lake Mead for, for you personally? Yeah, l- the last time we were there, I knew this was happening. And I'd been told, i have been fortunate I room with Aaron one year and, and he told me, he's like, that's out there. He's like, I'm marking it on 2D. And uh, mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, man, like I, I tried to, but I couldn't put it together. And, and I knew this was always available, but now we had the right tool. And I kind of knew what areas that it had been, you know, seen before. Right. So I literally went looking for it. And sure enough, man, it was clear as day. It was there. Striper schools and pelagic small mouth and large mouth underneath them from anywhere between 20 foot all the way to like 120. Wow. Um, and it was it was crazy to see. And a lot of those more like two and a half to three and a half pound fish are, you know, are doing that where you could cover a lot of water shallow and never run into a three pounder you know, or a two and a half pounder if you weren't in the right areas. Yeah. But in some of those areas where I'd caught some pelagic ones, all my big bites, all my four and a half to six pound bites that I had were all in six inches to a foot of water behind where I had caught those fish out there deeper. So kind of, kind of neat to see. And there was two things going up. I, I found fish on threadfin shad, like, you know, small micro style bait. Okay. And then I also found fish on, on like four to six inch gizzards, and the the both baits were typically in the same areas. Gotcha. Threadfin was deep, and the gizzards were shallow. And if there was no gizzards back there, I never really caught any two pounders underneath the the threadfin. It was kind of crazy. Wherever but, I caught good ones, I caught good ones deep and shallow. Gotcha. Did you change your bait presentation when you saw those different bait sizes that, that were prevalent in, in certain areas? Yeah. Uh, on those threadfin shad, those those striper schools is pretty much what it was. I, would, I couldn't get a jig head minnow through them or mm-hmm. a spoon or any of that. Like nothing that a striper could bite because these aren't like – these are a hundred fish, 200 fish schools. And there's like five large mouth down there or five, you know, five bass. Right. right. So I, I had to go to, you know, I caught some on worms, caught some on the dice. I had to go to things that they weren't, you know, a striper, a striper would kind of do. ignore. I, okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. That's cool. I saw, I saw uh, that you kind of highlighted a, a, you know, the dice bait in, in one of the wand bass videos. And, um, mm-hmm. What, what's the key to, to that bay? You know, it's kind of new. You kind of hear these rumblings over the last, you know, eight months or 12 months about people that are utilizing this, this dice style bait. Um, what, what do you think makes it effective? Obviously it was effective here because maybe the striper kind of ignored it. You could get down to, to the bass um, that you were targeting it, uh, underneath those schools or, or maybe around those schools. What, what makes that bait, you know, effective? Because it it, it looks cool. It looks interesting. But I don't know. I mean, you had Michael Neal win a uh, St. Lawrence event on it this year. And um, like I say, you hear rumblings of, of success with that bait. I think it's one of those things kind of like a, a Cinco, you know, kind of when that first thing started. It's just a fish catcher, you know, if the, the – instinctively the fish want to eat it like Mm -hmm. the fall rate has a lot to do with it you know there's there's a bunch of different methods on how to present it but in general if you just want to flatline it like you know whatever it does to the fish they eat it you know same thing with like a cinco we didn't know why a log style bait why that would work (laughs) but the the fall rate you know and that's that's kind of the same thing with the dice there's a there's a max salt and then there's a non-salt Okay. And, you know, whether you're fishing a weightless or you're drop shotting it, uh, putting a nail weight in it, there's a bunch of different things to get it to fall how you want or whatever. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm still learning. Like I've only had it for about a year now, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what's, what's the key to it. But 
uh, at meat, it was just a drop shot with a long leader. Uh, that way, because a lot of these fish, I never got my bait to the bottom. Mm. So those smallmouth, once it would clear the stripers, the smallmouth would just shoot up and bite it. But wow. if my drop shot went past them and they had to follow it down and I was in 70 feet, they would just run out of room and not eat it. Right. So I went to a super long leader with like a three sixteenths or even a quarter if it was a little windy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just throw that thing down there and I'd watch them shoot up and meet it. And, you know, I'd just catch them, catch them suspended. Yeah. Were you surprised that the overall weights, I mean, dude, you had day two at 1944, I think it was. Is that, is that right? Uh, 1980, 1980. Right 1980. This is the biggest bag I've ever, yeah, bag I've ever caught at Lake Mead. Sure. Yeah, I mean that uh, that's that's a giant bag there. Overall in the event, weights were up. Were you surprised yeah. from that? Have you heard like, you know, from any other anglers that, you know, hey, mead's fishing good? Do you feel like it's because of the the water levels changing and there's just more flats and areas for fish to grow? What what do you feel like is the dynamic behind Lake Mead right now? Yeah, I mean, it just seems super healthy to me, like from past times. And I know some of the weights in the spring were good. And even in the wintertime, it was taking 15 pounds to win. So, and the smallmouth got a lot bigger. Like there was a time there yeah. where you couldn't catch a 13 inch smallmouth. So, a lot of these smallmouth are two and a half to three pounds now. Um, I think the lake is just kind of on the up and up. I think the less pressure, five years, no big you know, national tournaments. So it's just club guys. Uh, just hasn't been beat up. The grass looked really good. I think everything was just kind of lining up for the lake to be better. Yeah. Um, for, for me, I even saw which, grass just growing out much deeper this year than, than I had seen in, in the U S yeah. opens that I fished there in the past. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. day three of the event, I kind of, I found a little thing in practice and, and um, I wasn't sure, but I kind of held it in my back pocket as I, I was hoping to kind of lean on an area for a couple days and then, and then readjust and kind of go to the, so I went there on day three and I had my biggest bag and it was all offshore grass cranking. And um, that's not something that you could have done it like me, you know, five years ago, just the grass wasn't growing that deep. So it was interesting just to kind of see that new dynamic of, of grass growth outside of the, the normal zone, I guess you might say. Right. Yeah, That's, no, definitely, definitely good. Hopefully we can see the U S open there next year. Yeah. Well, actually, um, Egan just recently announced Bill Egan, the tournament director for Juan Bass. Um, he announced that the U S open will definitely be back at Mojave in 2025. And um, there was a, a slight date change. So if you're a Western angler or looking to fish the West next year, uh, Bill Egan had already announced the 2025 schedule. He actually, Julius, I think he announced it in May. I mean, he announced it a long time ago. So, yeah. so anglers could put it on their schedule, but he's had to adjust the, um, the U S open. Now it will be in the first week of October instead of the traditional second week of October. So, um, but, but it will be back on Mojave, but event number four of the Juan Bass series next year will take place again at Lake Mead. Julius, are you going to be there to try and reclaim another title at Lake Mead next year? Yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I'm going to probably fish back East again next year. Uh, okay. at, you know, uh, waiting on the schedules to come out. Um, I fished three Toyotas, the Western Toyotas this year. So maybe, maybe invitationals, maybe one division of the opens, maybe two, just kind of depends on the schedules and the timing and uh, kind of what everything looks like. But definitely try to fish at least eight or nine professional events next year. So from your opinion, you bring up something that's a little heartfelt for Western anglers, but the Toyotas no longer out west so mlf uh has has made probably a tough decision for them to uh pull out of of the west coast from the toyota uh standpoint 
you know, participation was down this year. You you, you had um, yeah. a couple of tournament series fall last year. You kind of thinking, okay, Juan Bass is going to get better participation. Billy's done a great job putting on that series. But you also feel like, okay, maybe the Toyotas are going to get a little bit more participation, but they were down. And then MLF decides not to come back for 2025. What's your thought process as a, as a Western angler in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, I hadn't been home in a while, and it was kind of crazy to see, you know, only 65 boats showing up. Um, but I don't blame MLF what they what they did. I mean, they're definitely, you know, everyone's got to, it's a business, you know. Sure. So I, I understand it. And, you know, maybe it'll encourage Western anglers that if we don't come together and, you know, we don't start showing up, that we're not going to have anything to fish at some point, and, you know, which – for me, that's not a problem, but for some of these guys that, you know, have careers and kids and stuff and, you know, they can still, you know, do their work and get their sponsors and fish five to nine tournaments on the West for, yeah. you know, not some money that that's going to hurt a guy like that. So I don't I think know. It's, we'll, it's, we'll see. What's, um, yeah. I think it's interesting that, that, you know, Juan Bass this year has kind of proven there, the numbers are there to get. Um, 154 oh, boats at, at Shasta, 175 or thereabout boats at Clear Lake, uh, another 130 boats thereabouts at Lake Havasu for a stop three. Down a little bit for me, but still over 100 boats. And um, and and they're looking at 150 or so-ish there for the U.S. Open coming up in two weeks. Um, so, you know, there's definitely plenty of fishermen. And the, and the interesting thing – I was, I was talking about this to a friend of mine the other day that out West, it's hard to travel. I mean, you think of open schedules and that's a long way, dude, it's from here to the moon from where you live. But, but, but for, for Western anglers that are, you know, weekend anglers or like to fish some big events, it's difficult for them to go from NorCal to fish the Colorado river system in Arizona, Nevada, and yeah. kind of more or less Southern California um, because of the distance. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to do, but there's plenty of fishermen out, out West. So it's, it's, um, it's proven yeah. that, that it's doable. Yeah. The anglers are here. The participation is what it used All to right. be. For sure. We're going to, we're going to dive back into some thoughts on what you think about bass. Some of those changes. Uh, before we do that though, we are going to pause for a quick break. Well, stay tuned. We're going to be right back with more from Julius Mazzi right here in the Featured Angler Spotlight of Bass Edge Radio. Come on, man. Let's roll. What the? To catch the fish, you need to be one with the fish. With PowerPole shallow water anchors, you'll get the ultimate in precision, power, and control so you can catch more fish. No face paint or phony fins necessary. Excessive shock and vibration are two leading causes for premature battery failure. Prolong the life of your batteries with the new MegaWare Battery Guard. The Battery Guard sits under your battery and absorbs excessive vibration and bounce, reducing G-Shock by up to 80%. Great for boats or anywhere shock and vibration can damage a battery. The Battery Guard can easily be trimmed to fit virtually any custom shape or battery size. Save money by protecting your batteries. Spend more time on the water and less on maintenance. Find yours at MegaWare.com. What up, what up, what up? Here we are back. Little second session here with Julius. Maisie, your Juan Bass, Lake Mead champion. Love to hear that. Look, look. look let me tell everybody, Julius, we, <laughs> we had a, uh, dude, we had a cool night out uh, before the tournament started. We had a lot of fun. You were, you were teaching yeah. me and uh, your buddy, Steve, Steven Mack. That's, that's Steven's name, right? Yeah, yeah, Steve. Steve Mack, yeah. Yeah, you guys were teaching me the ropes on craps, dude. I'm 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 lit. I'm excited. I'm excited for going to uh the next event and uh maybe doing a little bit more gambling, maybe throwing down some craps on the crap table. And uh, I feel like, you know, 
I conquered a little bit of strategy thanks to your all's assistance and help. And uh, it was a ton of fun, man. I, I, lo I love I love the West Coast, especially the Colorado River events, just because you have that added element of a little bit of fun outside of the fishing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we have a good time at the tables for sure. Heck yeah, <laughs> you dude. get a bunch of fishermen around, man. We, we have a good time. <laughs> exactly. It's a lot of fun. So you started talking a little bit before the break about fishing back east again. Uh, you, you had mentioned you did a couple years of the uh, nine event EQ qualifiers. You decided not to participate in that this year, concentrating more out west, doing the Toyotas and fishing all the Juan Bass events. Um, big changes coming now with the Bassmaster Opens for 2025. Two divisions four events each top 50 in each division move on to a final slate of three events that they will now call the eq qualifiers the last three events um, not only qualifying open anglers from those two divisions to fish in those 50 from each so that's a total of 100 anglers but also allowing elite series anglers to fish in these three events and giving the opportunity for elite series anglers that are on the verge or cusp of not making the following year's field to kind of, you know, get their act event together in three events and finish in the top 10 to make that. What's your take on the new division and compared to the, to the nine event series? And uh, what, what do you see as pros, cons? What, what, do you, what are you digging about it? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's going to uh, give a regional guy an opportunity again, you know, to to travel. Not, nine events is a lot. You know, I did it for three years, and it's, it's super draining, especially, I mean, even if you live 10 hours from everything, it's still, still a lot. You know, where I live, 25, I mean, the closest tournament was in three years was Grand or Eufaula, and that's 15 to 17 hours, so. Right. The, the travel time, the, you know, away from home and all that, I feel like that's why a Western angler struggles. But just in general, to commit to nine events, you know, there's a lot of people that have other things going. And it's hard to just put everything away and get in your truck and camper and disappear for 200 days. Right. Um, so I think I think the two divisions uh, is definitely going to help uh, the turnout. And then I feel like you're going to get a lot more positivity from anglers and support rather than pitching yeah yeah I, I you know it definitely you know gets me looking at it um i'm i'm committed to fishing the 2025 Juan bass series again so that's what i'll do in in 25 and it, but um it's something that i would definitely look at in 26 after I, I, i'm one of those guys you know if it's brand new I'm going to kind of wait and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like if somebody comes out with a new trolling motor or somebody comes out with a new outboard or new whatever in the fishing industry, I'm always like, eh, let's just see and wait what happens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what, no, what, I'm interested to see the schedule and then, uh, you know, let, lay everything out and see, see what makes the most sense for me. Um, but that's definitely one on on the radar. Uh, ML, the MLF Invitational schedule looks really good. I've been to you know a lot of those places a lot of the same times of year, so I do like the way that sets up. But some of those new rules are a little you know I'm still trying to figure that out mentally. One day on, one day off of forward facing sonar, right? That's that's and then if yeah, you make, um, make the you championship, know. the the forward facing is back on again. Um, it's different. Right. I, I think we're going to go through a year of that as well, right? This All these regulations changing. NPFL, no forward-facing sonar, invitationals on one day, off one day, on the last day. What is it? BBT, um, you're allowed to use it two periods. Or, or no, one period. You're allowed to use it one period. You can't use it for two periods. And uh, yeah, and it just... I think we're going to go through this process of what's the best four facing sonar style of regulation. Um, that'll be a part of 2020 right. without. Yeah. We're, they're definitely going to be changing things over the next couple of years. I think we're going to see a lot of adjustments 
we're just yeah. gonna have to stay still and figure it out but billy billy told us he said we're not doing any of it we're just, we're just gonna keep trucking so that's cool let her rip let her rip I, you know i haven't seen obviously you implemented forward facing sonar to do well uh, at, at Lake Mead, but it was, it was a, uh, a diversity, you know, you didn't just rely on it. Um, then at Shasta, I feel like, you know, there was some of it going on, but it wasn't like the way a lot of anglers caught consistent, bigger bags, um, that I heard. Of course, I don't know a lot of Western guys, but, but, um, you know, I just didn't really see that as being a big player this year. Clear Lake, I think it played some, but man, there was just so much cover in the water at Clear Lake because the water was high and the fish started spawning while we were there. Um, I feel like at Havasu, you know, you could isolate and maybe locate some areas with fish, but again, the same thing. It was never a, a full on forward face. I, I just feel like the West Coast is diverse where it, it doesn't overtake a platform of fishing or an event of fishing whereas on the east coast if you go to certain lakes and you're not staring at your graph you're done bro what's what's your thought process on that as far as how the west is is using forward facing and and is it just the diversity of the lakes that yeah. that create a better platform out there yeah i think the west uh there's the forward facing sonar has been around, but it's not as implemented as hard here by anglers. I guess there's not as many competitive anglers here that are trying to make a career out of it that there is out there. So that style, understanding your forward, but also knowing still when to go to the bank and being pretty dang versatile at both. Right. You don't see that out here. You either see one or the other. You see the guy who grew up, you know, dropping a worm on 2D that is using forward facing sonar now, but he's probably not the best on the bank. Or then you see the guy who just, you know, he doesn't know to spin it on. So you don't <laughs> see a lot of versatility as far, you know, in, in the anglers. I mean, there definitely is, don't get me wrong, but you kind of see like one or the other where back east, if, if it's a, a forward deal, everyone's doing it and everyone's yeah. pretty much good at it. That's yeah. kind of where my mindset has been. So like when we went to meet, that's where it was. It's like, I have to find both and I have to find enough in both or you ain't going to win. Right, right. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch and, and see what you do next year. I'd love, love to see you on the Invitational. I think it'd be fun to watch. It's it's a great media platform. But again, you know, some some weird stuff on that forward-facing regulation. But, man, so many options that, that you have available. But coming up, dude, event number five, the U.S. Open, Lake Mojave. I know you're excited about it. I'm excited about it. Give us a little precursor on what you tend to expect. We talked about the weather right now out west. Bro, it's like freaking blazing summer out there still and is expected to be in the forecast for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's it's actually, I mean, for as long as I've lived here, I've, I've definitely endured some hot weather. But for September, going into late September, I have not seen it in the hundreds of so we're definitely enduring some some very late late summer action going on and uh, i think it's going to affect the fishing uh not necessarily in a negative way i just feel like the fish are going to be doing you know they're going to be a little bit further behind than they, they should be right now now mojave from i've never fished the u.s open at mojave so this is going to be my first one it's it, Right now, this is crazy. I we're we're taping Damn. here last day of September. It is uh holy cow, dude. It is uh 8 15 at night at Lake Mojave and it's 97 degrees. <laughs> right right now, right now, in Laughlin, Nevada, 97 degrees. <laughs> the 10-day the forecast. 112, 108, 109, 110, 108, 108, 108, 105, 102. That takes us up to perfect. The uh, you know th two days left of practice before the off day. So, do you feel like th there's also a dynamic at Mojave where the the water drops? 
and it usually drops around this time of year, about five or six foot. Um, how are all of these factors in your mind going to play in this tournament? Is it going to be completely different than U.S. Opens we've seen over the last three years? Is it like a whole new playing field for everybody? What's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely going to be some things we haven't seen. Um, I think kind of, I mean, just with the conditions, the time of the year is going to feel different than what it has been in the past. Uh, the weights were a little bit tougher last year. I wasn't there, but I mean, I've been paying attention and looking at them and there definitely was harder to catch more quality or the fishing was just tougher in general yeah. um, than it was, you know, the year before that. Right. So I think, you know, as long as we don't get a crazy weather change, I think it should be pretty good. Uh, you know, fish in the, in the, in the desert, like the heat, like, especially in the fall, you know, big small mouth. I, it sounds weird, but I, I think it's going to line up to be a good, good event. I like it. I like it. I, well, I'm looking for weather, it. Small mouth. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people just don't understand the dynamic of the Colorado River, though. Even though it's 100 degrees, the water temperature doesn't get into the 90s. You know, even though it's 112, 110 consistently, water temperature stays kind of in that low to mid 80s zone, especially at Mojave. You, you, have, you have all that water coming out of the bottom of Lake Mead, coming out of Hoover Dam, flushing into kind of a narrow river that doesn't give it a lot of chance to really warm up until it kind of gets down to the lower end. So I feel like there's a lot of uh, possibilities for, you know, fish to begin to react to some shorter days. Yet at the same time, there's going to be, you know, if you, if you, if you're digging the, the midsummer fishing, you can, you can knock that out in the main basin and kind of down on the lower end toward Catherine's Landing. If you're looking for some cooler water, all you got to do is run north and, and you're going to find some cooler water. Maybe in some cases you could run too far. I don't know. Have you ever fished that far up, like above Willow Beach and kind of that section? Do, do fish actually live that far up there? I've put in at Willow Beach, and there's a lot of current. Um, what kind of looks like eelgrass up there? It's it's a, I mean, it is straight run river. Yeah. Um, I've never caught a bass up there, but <laughs> I know guys have caught. I know guys have caught them up there, and there's definitely you know some sneak holes and some largemouth things, but that's never really been my focus when we go there. I mean, the smallmouth are predominantly the bigger fish, and. Uh, there's just more of them, and that's how you win. So, yeah, I've never really f fished that far up, uh, but I know guys do, and guys have one up there. Over, yeah, you know, over the years. Well, I think it's going to be uh, like you mentioned, real diverse, uh, different than it's been in the past, which will give you and I a little bit of an advantage. It's going to be kind of be wide open, so that'll be fun. And um, man, I, I hope we get to hang out a night or two up there. That'd be that'd be fun too. We have to have to hit the town yeah, one night. If, if nothing else, like, the great thing is we get an off day on Sunday, so we can we can kind of let loose a little bit on Saturday night, right? We gotta get we gotta get Ricky on the grab table. <laughs> oh man, dude, he, that's a shout out to Rick Harris, friend here of Bass Edge Radio, of course, but. Uh, um, yeah, that would be a sight to see. We might have to do a podcast if, if Rick hits the craps table. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Bass Edge craps. I like Good it. Deal. I like it. Julius, thank you so much, man. You got any final words for the listeners? You kind of broke down Lake Mead. Give us your thought on the opens. Kind of set us up for Lake Mojave coming up. Uh, I hope I hope the West Coast anglers can tune into Bass Edge and and even all the East Coast and Central U.S. guys. Man, come on out, support Juan Bass. This AAA format, Julius. Tell them a little bit about the AAA format and what you feel like is is so advantageous about the style of tournament Juan Bass puts on. Yeah, so for as long as one bass has been around, uh, you know, I fished my first U.S. Open when I was like 13 years old and as a AAA. Um, what's neat about it is it's a shared weight format. So there's positive and negatives in that. But for someone who's trying to learn, 
you know, and, you know, want to, to progress as an angler, you don't necessarily feel like, you know, you're getting backseated or your guy's working against right. you. He wants you to be successful because you can help him. So, you know, me being a young kid wanting to learn and, and kind of being pretty green, you know, I, I've had some bad draws where people don't really like that format. You know, when I was a triple A and they just don't want to work with you and it's like drawing a guy like you do in a bass open, like different, you know, that's how it feels. But then you also get guys that, you know, invite you up front or, Hey, you know, try this. I'm going to throw a top water. I want you to throw a worm. And it, you know, he brings you in and, and makes you, you know, breaks things down for you. And it's, it's a pretty neat format uh, for people trying to learn. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, I think we, we saw uh, Nick Salvucci, who's a great Western angler, had some boat troubles at Lake Mead. And he went just switched side to go on the triple A and ended up ended up kicking some butt over there, too. So uh, it's 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 just a cool form format. A lot of fun, man. I look forward to seeing you at Mojave. Any final words before we let you go? And uh, of course, I, as always, I appreciate you being here on on Bass Edge and taking just taking time out for the for the anglers, Julius. What do you got to say for uh, your final thoughts? Yeah, no, man, uh, really special week. Uh, you know, been at it, you know, a long time, not as long as you, but definitely, definitely been uh, been grinding at it for for a hot minute now. And it was nice to finally seal the deal on a big one. I've been close. Uh, quite a few times over the years and you know some good top tens and stuff but never never uh the big ones so it was nice to to kind of get that out of the way with a few more to go and you know fish the rest of the year stress-free uh it's pretty pretty neat also uh you know thank you for having me on here and uh look forward absolutely. to the next couple of tournaments and we'll roll some dice where yeah absolutely and where can we catch that youtube stuff you were talking about you know introducing products that the hookup has um what's that youtube channel i think that's a great avenue for anglers to kind of see new unseen stuff in the industry yeah so the hookup tackle on uh on youtube and then the hookup tackle.com is our website uh we've got some video links in there and then as well as instagram we post every single day new drops, new bait colors. We do a lot of custom colors with companies. So we're posting on there every day and then there'll be, you know, YouTube links on there. So all of our platforms are, you know, active and we're always doing things. I'm filming, you know, when I'm home between events, like two to three days a week, uh, you know, different baits here, here around the house and stuff. So lots of good content on there right now. There it goes. That's the juice. Julius, thank you so much for being with us. We will see you in a couple of weeks, no doubt. Y'all stay tuned. Bass Edge Radio is going to be right back just for a quick little closing moment here. This is another great episode of Bass Edge Radio. See you here back in just a moment. The newest addition to the Bass Cat STS family is here. Introducing the Caracal STS, showcasing aggressive styling, paired with enhanced performance, and a continued dedication to raising the bar. Measuring in at 20 feet 2 inches with an ultra-wide 96-inch beam and rated for a 250 to 300 horsepower engine, the Caracal STS boasts agility and speed and is finished with premium features to satisfy any angler. Bass Cat Boats. Feel the rush. What up, what up, what up? Here we are, back for our last little segment here of the program. Thank you all. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe button. It's been a lot of fun finally being back here with another episode of Bass Edge Radio. Man, it's been a long time. Way, way too long. Uh, big shout out again to Julius. Thank him for uh, being a part of this program. Man, a couple highlights uh, from, from that. Man, I feel like, you know, just from the West Coast and, and understanding this, this, you know, vast area and different uh, layers of fishing that they have out there west from NorCal to the Colorado River. It's no question why you get some fantastic fishermen coming from the west back to the east. Uh, you could start to list them. I'm not going to list them all because I know I'd miss some, but um, I'll give a shout out to John Murray. He was top five there at that Lake Mead um, event that, that Julius won. Um, of course, you know, he's originally from Arizona, just basic absolute legend now living in Tennessee. But um, so, 
it, it's cool to see everything that's going on out west. I've had a fantastic time fishing out there this year. Um, good enough time that I'm looking forward to doing it, you know, running it back in 2025. So we're going to do the Wand Bass against uh, events again. But be sure to tune in to the U.S. Open at Lake Mojave. Um, the event uh, practice starts next week. And then uh, let me make sure I get the date right for everybody. October 6th. Is it no? October 13 is the expo day. And then the event is October 14, 15, and 16. Uh, Wombats is doing a great job with their social media on Instagram. You can also watch the weigh ins on Facebook and YouTube kind of follow the whole thing. They give updates as, as the events going along. So, uh, us open, uh, one of the iconic events, obviously in the sport of bass fishing. So, uh, make sure you check that out next week. And, uh, guys, like I said, it's just been a great time being back on the show. Um, we're going to do this again very soon. Uh, probably right after the U S open, we will, uh, kind of talk to whoever is doing well out there and you know anything else we want to talk about here on Bass Edge Radio but like I said we're going to we're going to we're going to break down everything that's happening in 2025 in the tournament series and um, all over the place dude just so much going on don't miss our next episode we'll be back Bass Edge Radio see you again soon Bye-bye.